Good morning to all of you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Sunday morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Puri, for this uh, talk. I'm going to deviate a little bit from the standard uh, guidelines that we have because I thought we would share the experience that we've been having. Uh, Vardia Hospital, as you already know, was the first uh, pediatric DRTV center in the country. And we are a state uh, center of excellence. Dr. Puri has been active in that. We have a 10 bed ward. So eight beds for the TB patients general, and two, which is the pediatric TB ICU, which has just been formed last 15 days. I think the city of Mumbai did not have a pediatric TB ICU till now. So I was after the management for a long, long time that we need to make an ICU. Finally, through some CSR funds, we've been able to make an ICU. So for the first time in the city of Mumbai, we've got some pediatric beds for ICU patients. So that is, uh, that's been all the help. She's helped me with the AIC part of it and the natural ventilation and all that. So hopefully this will be useful for the children of Mumbai. Now we come to TB diagnosis. As Dr. Shushant already said, we don't go now to fever cough and uh, you know contact with TB, multipositive and start treatment. We all look at microbiological diagnosis. And if you look at microbiological diagnosis, I think CBNAT has come out in a big way. We have two types of CBNAT, that is the expert and we have the true net that is available. Most of the places in Mumbai, we have uh, expert. And what it helps us is not only detect uh, rifampicin resistance, uh, so it can tell us the difference between drug sensitive and drug resistant TB. Now, what is the in, uh, method by which expert works? Expert is an automated system. It's completely automated. You just take the sample, put it into the cartridge, and you get a report in two hours. The everything of PCR technology amplification, the sequencing, everything is done automatic by the machine. So the handling process, the contamination part is very, very negligible with this uh, machine. And what it does is it looks at the RPO gene, which is very specific for rifampicin resistance. We all know that if you have rifampicin resistance, the child indirectly is going to have INH resistance and it's going to be an MDR patient. So that tells us indirectly that this is going to be an MDR TB. So when you have rifampicin resistance on gene expert, that is your RR, it tells you that indirectly this is an MDR TB and you go on straight away with your second life therapy. I had till now never seen a patient where rifampicin resistance was there and INH was sensitive. It was always rifampicin resistance with INH resistance. Last week I saw a patient for the first time where I saw rifampicin resistance and an INH sensitive. Yes. And not only on LPA, but I saw that even on the DST. So it's not something, I mean, we say this is the, you know, it's 100% if you have rifampicin resistance, you're going to have INH. But sometimes run of the mill case you may end up seeing. So that was a very unusual aspect that you see. But most of the times when you have rifampicin resistance, it's going to be INH resistance. Now, so this is the machine, you take a sample, you put it in the cartridge, you put it into the machine and you get a report. This is true for most of the samples that you send, except for a stool sample. The stool sample has to be centrifuge, it has to be standardized, you need technicians to prepare the stool sample before you can put it into the machine. So doing a stool gene expert is not that easy as doing a gastric lavage or a gastric aspirate or a bronchioalveolar lavage. So that thing you have to keep in mind. Now, about the gene expert, the plain gene expert, which is right now in the program, I'm not talking about ultra, I'm talking about gene expert, which is in the program, we can detect up to 113 colony forming units. So that's good enough, that's very good, because it's better than your AFP stain. Even if it's a possible acillary disease, you'll pick up this. And the most important thing, it's very specific for MTB complex. So you're not going to get a BCG giving your gene expert positive, though you sometimes do get that. I'm going to talk about it when we see BCG agonitis. And because it's a closed system, as I told you, cross-contamination is less. Uh, when I started the HIV work, and it was the year, I think, 2004, we were doing a lot of uh, DNA PCRs for uh, infant diagnosis. At that time, I was getting a lot of them coming positive PCRs. And then subsequently, when I was doing ELISAs at 9 months, 18 months, I used to get these ELISAs negative. 
So I couldn't understand why these PCRs were coming positive. And these kids are asymptomatic. It was pretty traumatic to tell the parents that, you have, look, your PCR is positive, probably the child is infected, HIV positive. At those days, we didn't have any drugs except for Zydowodin. So luckily, we didn't put them into ARD. I actually went to the labs that were doing these PCR technology. And I realized there was so much contamination that was occurring when you do these uh, in-house PCRs. There's a lot of contamination that takes place at the time of amplification or at the time when you're doing colorimetry method, whatever you're using the technology. So that was my first research actually, which I did. I didn't have a student at that time, so I used to sit in the OPD, collect the files, go through the data, put it on Excel, do the statistics myself. So that was the first research and that told me that PCRs were false positive to the tune of 50% for HIV. I'm talking about HIV. And then when we had the National uh, Technical Expert Group on HIV in the year 2007, that was the first time the guidelines came up. And when we were talking about putting PCR technology into the government setup and having PCR, my first caution to them was, look, you're going to get false positives. And uh, they said, no, we are going to do dry blood, we are not going to do whole blood. And they started getting these false positives and they called this term as HIV discordant. So if you have an HIV PCR positive and then you call them as uh, negative on ELISA, so they are discordant. So the most important aspect of gene expert which I realized is everything is automated. So this cross contamination is not taking place. So chances of having a false positive PCR is almost negligible. Yeah. So if you have a gene expert positive, sometimes we do get, in fact, uh, we had this problem around two or three months back where whichever bowel samples we were sending, we were getting gene expert positive. And I was wondering, these children are not TB, why are they getting? And then I realized it was contamination to the bronchoscope. So if you go back, to you know how you're collecting the sample. So your PCR may be positive, it's not a wrong report, but how did you collect the sample? So uh, I do a lot of upper GI and colons, but the bronchoscopy is done by the pulmonologist. Now when you have a proper cleaning, you need to actually do it for one hour cleaning. And if you're going to remove your scope in 20 minutes, you're still going to have the MTB onto the scope. The question here that I faced was, okay, I knew this report was false positive because of uh, you know, improper cleaning of the scope. But that scope went into the patient's body. Now we've introduced that MTB into that body. Do I give him TPT or not? So that was the question that I faced, you know, when we started seeing these questions. So every time you have to interpret the report very cautiously. I'll give you an example. I saw one patient from Thani. This was pretty many years back. This child came with hematemesis. But somebody thought it was hemoptysis and got an x-ray chest and then send a GL for AFP staining. In those days, we didn't have PC, uh, gene expert. Now those AFP came positive. And the x-ray was normal, bang normal. And you just can't make out why that, G, you know, that AFP has come positive. I had to call up the lab. It was a lab in Thani. I asked them, for your AFP staining, which water did you use to wash this leg? They said tap water. So now you know it's environmental mycobacteria. So that's contamination again. So again, you always interpret these reports with a clinical basis. You will have a new system now, which is Gene Expert Ultra, as compared to the plain Gene Expert. What's the difference here? Here, it incorporates multi-copy amplification with these two other targets, apart from the RPO gene. Okay, so that's one thing that is different here. And the colony forming units, so the number of bacilli that are required to actually pick up a positive report is much less. So Gene Expert Ultra, WHO recommends this as the new test now. The government has to take it up because I think the cost is one issue that prevents us from uh, taking it into the program. Gene Expert Ultra has actually been recommended for extra pulmonary TB, like your CSF samples, your plural uh, samples, where you have a less bacillary load, you could use a Gene Expert Ultra. Now, Gene Expert Ultra, you get reports as high, medium, low, very low. But there is a category known as trace, okay? Trace, which is included, in which you have these new targets which are positive, the IS1081 and IS6110, but the RPO is negative. 
So here you are not sure whether the child has TB or not TB, whether you need to treat or not. In such a scenario, you may need to repeat a sample. Why am I bringing this up here? Because we are in a city of Mumbai. A lot of us are private pediatricians. We may be following the program guidelines, but a lot of us may land up doing an ultra. And then we wouldn't know how to interpret this report. How do, do we start treatment? We don't start treatment. Do we start first line? A lot of times your ultra will give you indeterminate for RR. In fact, we are in the process of doing this study because we are doing ultra at Padia. So to the program, we do plain gene expert, which is free of cost for all the patients. But if the patient can afford, we do an ultra. And then sometimes you see this indeterminate report. You don't know whether it is rifampicin sensitive or rifampicin resistance. And then you don't know how to treat it. So at that moment, you should know how to interpret these reports. Whether you should repeat the sample, go for, suppose you've done a GL and it showed indeterminate. Do you want to go for a BAL now and get a better yield? So that decision has to be taken. We have TrueNet. I, I don't know whether Mumbai has TrueNet here. Okay, so we have TrueNet. Now this is also a CBNAT. It's a nucleic acid amplification test. The thing is here, the extraction is done manually. Okay, so it's not an automated system. So there is a risk that there may be contamination. Results are obtained within one hour. And the most important thing is it's battery operated. So you don't need electricity actually. You can, don't need air conditioning. However, because you are going to do amplification manually, you will need a technician. Gene expert is something you and I can also do as pediatricians. You know, it's not that uh, difficult for us to do it. The most other disadvantage is it needs centrifuging of large volume specimens like gastric lavage and aspirates because you are going to collect 5 ml or 3 ml and you need to centrifuge that. So G, uh, TrueNet is developed by a firm in Goa. The major advantage is it's battery operated. The disadvantage is it's not fully automated and it's net centrifugation and it's a two step process. You have to do the extraction and then addition to the DNA chip. So you need a specialized technician for doing this test. I wanted to bring this slide up because if you don't collect as pediatricians, you don't collect the specimen correctly, then whatever algorithm you will follow, it doesn't make any sense. So you need to know if you are going to do sputum, you need 3 ml early morning. If it's going to be induced sputum, it has to be 3 ml ideally early morning. If it's gastric aspirate, you need 5 ml. Just it's on an empty stomach. Gastric lavage, it has to be, sometimes you're trying to do an aspirate, but you don't get enough, so you put in normal saline or distilled water. You ideally put in distilled water. And then, you find that you need to aspirate 10 ml of the fluid. So remember this, this is the most important thing that has to be done for you to remember that the sample has to go. I'll tell you one uh, case I had. Uh, that child was actually four years, he was from Akola, uh, zero positive and uh, we wanted a bronchoalveolar lavage at that time because we wanted to rule out lots of things, not only TB but fungal, aspergillus, everything. He went to the OT, they did a bronchoscopy. It came in the tube, when those days we didn't have those tubes, we had that cotton on the top and the nurse inverted the tube. So everything went into the cotton. And I had to run back to the, it was my off day, I had to run back to the hospital and counsel the parents. Look, 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 we try and still treat the patient. That child now is 24 years old. He's an engineer. <laughs> but these kind of mishaps happen in, when you're doing sampling. So your residents need to be really trained. Especially when we send it to the surgeons. Yeah. Invariably they put in formula. Yeah. In spite of telling, so what we do is, I send a resident to the OT. Yeah. You please stand there holding the formalin uh, yes. tube. Otherwise, normal it will come in for, uh, Sorry, normal saline tube. Yeah. Otherwise, it will come in formalin. Yeah. So all these specimens have to go in normal saline and not formalin. So if you are going to send for microbiological test, make sure it goes in normal saline. So this is the method how gastric lavage is done. You measure the length. All of us know how to put in a dry strip, so I'm not going to go into that. But the most important thing is you need to aspirate 5 ml. You first try to aspirate. And after you aspirate, you need to neutralize the acid. We don't do this. We don't neutralize the acid. So if it's less than 5 ml, you need to add 1 ml of soda bicarb. 
and if it's more than final, you need to have two levels of solar makeup. So this is the most important. If you don't <coughs> neutralize the asset, then you are not going to get. Uh, can I add something? Yeah. Within the private sector, we neutralize it if there is a delay in transporting the sample from the collection to the lab. Yeah, I'll tell you the why. Transporting it yeah. immediately, we generally don't. Do the that. transport may not take time, but sometimes your lab is overworked on the gene yeah, expert. After communicating yeah. with the lab. Yeah. So sometimes what happens, the sample is lying on the gene expert because they are waiting, all their four modules are occupied, the machine has four modules, there's a waiting time everywhere. So even though it's one hour, two hours, you may get a report after 72 hours because there's a waiting time that goes on. So it's better you talk to the lab when you're collecting the sample and if there is going to be a delay, add the soda banker. Now if you go to nasopharyngeal aspirate, if you look at WHO guidelines, they said that uh, you can use nasopharyngeal aspirate. We are not going to recommend that. Currently, no nasopharyngeal aspirate. There is a lot of cochrane analysis which says it, it's the yield is going to be really minimal when you do nasopharyngeal aspirate. CSF, you're, if you're going to send, you need to send 2 ml. Any serosal fluids, pleural fluid, uh, ascitic, you need to, pericardial fluid, you need to have at least 1 ml minimum, okay, for the microbiological. I'm just talking about CB9. If you're going to send, uh, MJIT, that has to be another sample. You cannot say MJIT will be the same sample. The MJIT has to be a separate NS bottle and it has to be the same amount of uh, material. The stool. Now stool is going to, at the moment not in the program, but we are seriously thinking about including stool after some research has been done all over the country about how stool works. And uh, stool you require at least one tablespoon. Uh, we have been using Stool Gene Expert Ultra at Wadia and preliminary reports are pretty promising. In fact, uh, I remember we had one child in the, I'm going to discuss that case. So WHO says that you could do the microbiological diagnosis on CBNet through sputum, nasopharyngeal aspirate, gastric aspirate or stool. At the moment, nasopharyngeal aspirate and stool is not in the program. So please keep that in mind. Why? Because we don't have data on Indian children. The only thing that we have from the subcontinent is this study from Bangladesh, where they used stool ultra on, and they found sensitivity and specificity to be good. But the only thing was the problem was the trace. When you get the trace, which I mentioned on the earlier slide, when you get a trace report. And if you look at the Cochrane analysis, it says that it varies, ultra sensitivity varies as for the specimen type with highest having sputum then followed by gastric aspirate and stool. Nasopharyngeal aspirate has the lowest sensitivity. Okay, so at the moment we are only going to stick to sputum, GL, BAL, gastric aspirate, that's all, nothing else. The lamp test? That is only if we are suspecting renal TB not otherwise, we don't use it routinely in children. Because they say that there is a lot of uh, bacteria yes. in the uh, yeah. cases of yeah. tuberculosis and yeah. find a lot of gene expert positive in the urine. Yeah, but, but it, in HIV, they, they, they actually use LAM yeah. rather than the gene expert. In HIV, they use LAM, but the urine is also, uh, gene expert is also found to be positive. Yeah, so when we get gastric lavage, we have, see we don't have Indian data again on urine. To try something experimental would not be, you know, you can't recommend that because each test is going to, though it's there in the program free of cost, but you just can't keep on trying different specimens. Uh, if you're going to FA, FNAC, okay, of the cervical lymph, no. What is preferred is an FNAB rather than an FNAC. Okay, a lot of times you have these, uh, in fact right now I have a patient who had a huge cervical node and uh, his uh, uncle is an ENT specialist actually. So he came to me and said, we need to, I've done an FNAC and it's reactive. So then when I saw him, he had multiple lymph nodes everywhere, cervical, axillary, uh, invinal. So we thought maybe this is infectious mononucleosis or this is lymphoma. So FNAC is not the, choice that you would do. Actually, this child turned out to have EBV, infectious mononucleosis. So FNAB, if you can get, that is a biopsy, then it's good. Otherwise, you'll have to do for a lymph node excision. 
So FNAC, what happens is you only get a smear. You can't do a gene expert on that. So you won't be able to do anything except for a, just a smear. Sometimes in disseminated TB, especially when you're suspecting MAC or HIV positive patients, you want to do a bone marrow culture and you send the culture. So if you're send, going to send a bone marrow, you need to do one ml of sample. So I just wanted to tell you about this child. This child is right now there in the hospital. He's a three-year-old, uh, abdominal pain, distension, vomiting, fever. He's, he was in the surgical ward. He had a perforation. There was a seal peritonitis, omental caking, necrotic, mesenteric nodes, consolidation. He was suspecting disseminated TB. Now his GL came negative. We were suspecting TB. The surgeon said we'll take him for an open biopsy, omental biopsy. He said, let's try stool. So if we can get away with a non-invasive, so we did a stool gene expert ultra and that came positive and it was refumbicent sensitive. So what helped here was, you know, getting away with a non-invasive test and not doing an invasive. To take that call, you will need some uh, consultation or some opinion. You just can't do this on your own. But this is one area where this thing helped us. Now you have your line progresses. So if you look at the algorithm, X-ray chest, then your microbiological diagnosis, CBNAT. If you have a CBNAT positive, either drug sensitive or drug resistance, you send an LPA. So if it's drug sensitive, you send your first line LPA. If it's drug resistant, you send first line plus second line LPA. So your LPAs help to detect INH resistance. It helps you to detect second line LPA that is for your gyrase A and B, that's for your fluoroquinolones, and the RRS and EIS for that is for your aminoglycosides. So this is where it helps. Ideally, you're supposed to get this report in 72 hours, but I think, Dr. Puri, there's a big backlog on this. So uh, these are the genes that are tested on the LPA. You have your RPO for the rifampicin, CAT-G and INH, which helps you to decide about high-dose INH versus ethionamide, whether you can use that or not. Then you have a gyrase A and B that helps you to decide whether you can use levoflox or high-dose moxiflox. And then you have second lines for your injectables. We hardly now use injectable therapy. We used to use it earlier for children, but now we hardly use. So your LPAs help you to determine the, and these are the way the LPA reports come. So you have these bands and depending on the band, you can pick up what resistance has been there. New thing that has come, and we're trying to push the CTD, the central TV, to include this into the program is the GeneXpert XDR panel. So I talked about GeneXpert Plane, I talked about GeneXpert Ultra, and now it's the XDR panel. So XDR panel also looks at INH, it looks at fluoroquinolones, it looks at second line injectables and ethionamide in a single test. So what happens is I have a sample, I got RR or I got RS. I want to know whether there's INH mono resistance, if it's RS, that's rifampicin sensitive, but I still want to rule out INH mono resistance. Or I've got an RR and I want to rule out XDR, pre-XDR, so I use this panel. The thing is, I can get the report in less than 90 minutes. We have an XDR panel at Wadia. Uh, so patients who can afford, we do the XDR panel in there. And the only thing is you need to have a module which is a 10 color module. So you need little rectification in your gene expert machine. And uh, this has been actually advised by WHO to include it. And we are pushing the CTD to include this into the program because this would change this would be a game changer in changing the treatment for MDR versus XDR versus pre-XDR. And uh, it will also help us in Mumbai, we are very rarely able to start the shorter BDQ oral regimen in children. But if we get this, we may be able to, you know, get an idea whether we can go on to the oral BDQ. Because if you see the DST pattern of Mumbai, we know that 50% of the patients are resistant to ethambutol, they are resistant to pyrazinamide, they are resistant to ethionamide. So we are hardly able to put patients onto the shorter oral regimen. Dr. Shushant will be talking about that later. So you have these genes which can be picked up, isonized ethionamide, fluoroquinolones, and, the, and you can see the sensitivity and specificity of this XDR panel, which is pretty good. So again, we, we've been using this at Wadia. 
So a two and a half year old boy, he came with fever, vomiting, two episodes of convulsions. He was diagnosed to, suspected to have TB meningitis. Gene expert ultra came positive, medium, with RR. So that tells us that this is NDR. We did an XDR panel. We found a CAT-G mutation, so we could not use high-dose INH, but we could use ethionamide. And ethionamide is a wonderful drug if you want to give it for CNS. It penetrates the blood-brain barrier very nicely. We got a virase 1 mutation, so we could not give low-dose levoflux, but we could give high-dose uh, moxiflux. And so the regimen immediately we used was, so this tells you that this is a pre-XDR. The regimen immediately went to Bedaquilin, Linizolid, that's your group A, with high dose moxiflux. So three from group A, you had clofazamine, cyclosyrin, and we added ethionamide as an additional drug because just for the CNS. So, so the CNS penetration, because what a lot of times what happens is when you have CNS TB and you're using cyclo, uh, spore, uh, cyclosyrin, it causes a lot of CNS toxicity in the long run. And a lot of times in TBM patients, we've had to stop cyclosyrin, say, after six, seven months. And then at that time, to add one drug becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So here, we had ethionamide immediately, which we could use. So we added one drug as a CNS. So here, you can individualize. You take the guideline as a base, but you can individualize based on the DST or the genotype of the patient. You have genetic sequencing, like how we do nowadays uh, gene testing, so we send whole genome and whole exome and we send clinical exome and then we do Sanger sequencing for all the genetic disorders on the human DNA. This is the same that you could do on the tuberculous bacilli. You could do sequencing, so you could do pyro sequencing, Sanger sequencing, next generation sequencing. I think JJ has already started doing this on an experimental basis because the last time I spoke to Amita yes. Joshi, she had got those, uh, yes. yeah. So this will really help us. We are setting up this lab at Vardia. So next generation sequencing will go a long way to get a mutation because we either depend on genotype assay or phenotype assay to determine resistance. And if you can get a genotype assay, then that's more wonderful because you don't have in vitro, in vivo difference as compared to a phenotypic, like a DST. DST in vivo, may show that it's in vitro may show it's not working but in vivo it may still be working so that difference will not occur so this is something that is going to come in the future then you have the tb mj culture we earlier used to use the lg medium six weeks solid culture now we have a liquid culture so we do a tb mj culture and uh, you can do dst on it so the algorithm, I'll be coming to that, how you send your specimens, when should you send the specimens for a li liquid culture? So, and what resistance testing should be, what DST should be done? Which test should be done? So you have all these rifampicin, INH, pyrazinamide, moxiflox, levoflox, levozolid, amikacin, canamycin, capriomycin, clofazamine, bedaquilin, delaminin, which we can do DST. The Ethambutol and ethionamide, the DST may still be inaccurate. So we don't know if you get sensitive or resistance, how to interpret. And uh, for cyclosyrin, for meropenem pass, we still don't have DSTs available. So just a sequence of these molecular tests, LPA, you're supposed to get the report in one to three days. And you can do first line and second line LPA. CBNAT, your expert, you get a report in two hours. Uh, you can do a true net which gives you one hour for TB detection and one hour for rifampicin resistance detection. So this is the BRTB. So if you have presumptive TB, you've done an X-ray chest, you've done a NAT. Your NAT does not show rifampicin resistance. Okay, your NAT has shown MTB, but no rifampicin resistance. So your reg regimen is going to be for DSTB. But you still want to rule out INH monoresistance. So you will do the first line LPA. If first line LPA shows INH resistance, you will stop the DSTB treatment and put the child on moxiflox, pyrazinamide, linozolid, and clofazamine. I mean, uh, you will put the child on the first line uh, for treatment for INH monoresistance. And you will send the DST for moxiflox, pyrazinamide, linozolid, and clofazamine because you want to know all the other drugs are working or not. So this will be on the basis of the first line 
uh, this thing. And if you have NAT which shows rifampicin resistance, you will send the second, first line and second line LPA. And you will start the second line regimen. You will send DSTs for Z, BDQ, clofazamine, moxiflox, linezolid and DLM. So you don't need to send the whole panel, you will be sending DSTs for that. And then you check the LPA reports. If no additional resistance, you can continue with the MDR regimen. If there is an H resistance detected or FQ resistance detected, that means it's a pre-XTR where you can't use shorter regimen, you have to go on to the longer oral regimen. So this is how your labs help you. So when you get a gene expert positive, next step is straight away LPA. Depending on DS, first line, if it's DR, RR resistance, you will send a second line LPA and a first line LPA. You want me to talk about tuberculin skin test here? Okay. So I think there was a lot of discussion on Mantu and Ikra. So earlier we used to use Mantu. The problem is, it's a tuberculin skin test. It's a purified protein derivative. So this antigen is common to MTB. It's there in BCG. It's there in environmental mycobacteria. So you can get a Mantu positive due to any of these three things. Okay, so it doesn't tell me uh, this Mantu positive is due to what? You're supposed to use two TU, PPD, RT23. Now, RT23 was basically added because Mantu used to be given in a glass syringe. And the mantra used to stick to the glass syringe. So if you were going to inject it intradermally, it would still stick. So this was like a detergent that was added to prevent that sticking of the mantu to the glass syringe. So earlier we used to use PPDS. And now because we are adding that twin AT, and we are using 2TU PPD RT23. What we take as mantu test, uh, we take it as positive, it's more than 10 millimeter. And in HIV co-infected, we take 5 millimeter. Mantu can remain positive for years together. So you don't know how to interpret that Mantu. One, whether it's MTB, BCG, NTM. Second, when was the child infected? Two years back, six months back, ten years back. You don't know how to interpret that. So it cannot differentiate past or recent infection. You can have BCG and environmental mycobacteria giving you. So we expect that the younger the child, the most likely it is going to be positive due to infection. We expect that, but BCG can also give you that same thing. You can get a false negative Mantu also, because of energy or you are in that window period where you still not develop the immunological response. You have a very old TB infection, very young age. If it's a disseminated TB, you can get Mantu negative, or you've not given the Mantu correctly. So that can all be results. So earlier, as I told you, we used to use the old PPD, PPDS, and then we started adding twin AT just to prevent it's a detergent. And now WHO recommends you have to give one to two TU of PPD RT23. This is equivalent to five TU. Quite a few labs in Mumbai still use PPDS, and they use ten TU. So they don't even use five TU PPDS; they use ten TU. So a lot of times you get a patient who comes with a Mantu report positive. You have to look which PPD was used. And if it's 10 TU, you have to ignore that report. <coughs> Only if it is 1 to 2 TU RT23 or it's 5 TU PPDS, then only take that report as positive. Otherwise, ignore that report. Secondly, we say Mantu reading has to be done in after 48 hours. Sometimes patient doesn't come back after 48 hours. He's come back after four days. Do you read a Mantu? up to seven days. You can read a Mantu up to seven days. So you could still do a reading up to seven days. Sometimes after 48 hours, the induration has not occurred, but it has occurred after five days. You still take that as positive. So you will inform the parents that you will come back for the reading after 48 hours, but keep a watch for the next seven days. And you're supposed to take horizontal reading. Sometimes you get a Mantu reading 15 by 12. It makes no sense. Okay, vertically it's the lymphatics. That's why the induration is taking place. You have to take the horizontal reading and only one reading. So this is considered more than 10. Otherwise, you don't consider. And no erythema. It has to be induration, not the redness. But the induration has to be more than 10. Just an example, a two and a half year old boy. This is commonly done, I think, in practice. Uh, pain in abdomen for seven days, ultrasound shows non-necrotic nodes. Mantu by 10 to you was 10 by 10 millimeter HIV LIs are negative. Do you think this is TV? Okay, 
So nodes are non-necrotic mantles by 10 TU, so you don't. Now we come to Igras. Igras we had two types earlier. We had Quantiferon, that was the first generation Igra. And we had LE spot. What is the principle is, you inject the TB antigen, you take the blood, withdraw the blood, you inject the TB antigen into the blood and look for release of interferon gamma. So there were new antigens that were there, that was ESAT6 and CFP10. This is not your purified protein derivative. This is very specific for MTB. So BCG is not going to give you this problem with IGRA. So your IGRA positive almost tells you that this is MTB. Very rarely a few of the environmental mycobacteria can give you a false positive IGRA, but very rarely. So any spot is hardly used nowadays. Nobody uses any spot. Everybody uses quantiferon. Now we have quantiferon TB gold and you also have a quantiferon TB gold plus. We've already started doing research on the TB gold plus and I will tell you the problems we face with that. The thing is, uh, the patient does not have to come back again to, for the reading. You can just ask the lab to send the report. Problem is the cost and second, a blood collection takes place. We did this study in 2014 where we did uh, Mantu and Igra and we wanted to see these are all patients suspected of TB, what was the report. We found that TST positive and Igra negative are 11. Okay, this is the most important thing that I wanted to show you. So was it false positive Mantu or was it a false negative Igra? Okay, we followed up these kids. And none of them developed TB. Th these were suspect TB disease. I'm not talking about latent infection. So what this does this tell me? That probably these were false positive TST. So again, I told you, your TST, to read that Mantu is a problem. The question that uh, Dr. Dhulake asked about uh, Mantu and how do you know how previous was the infection? Now, will you treat a child who's suspected latent TB with a Mantu positive? I would not treat so IGRA can be used to rule out false positive TST. Okay, so now Mantu is hardly recommended, we hardly do Mantu, but IGRA is the test that you should all do. So if you're suspecting latent TB, do an IGRA. If you're suspecting TB disease, do a gene expert x-ray. Okay, that's very clear. Don't use IGRA to make a diagnosis of TB disease. You are going to have a new skin test, which is known as the CTB. It's like a Mantu test. Only thing is the antigen is going to be the same as that you use in the IGRA. It's going to be ESAT 6 and CFP 10. So it's the same IGRA that is being done in vivo. So this is going to be a new test. And uh, I think ICMR has already done a study on this and they've found excellent results. So pretty soon it should come into the program. So CTB should be something that should come. Uh, just now, I just wanted to discuss two cases where it's very essential to get a microbiological diagnosis. Just as we said that we are missing out TB, we should not make an erroneous diagnosis of TB. This was a 12-year-old boy. He has received T, uh, TB treatment in the past, one at seven months for BCG adenitis, second at seven years for cervical lymph node TB, no microbiological diagnosis. He's had history of recurrent infection, salmonella. He's had two episodes of pneumonia requiring hospitalization. So probably some immunodeficiency. He was worked up. He was found to have MSMD, mycobacterial susceptibility, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases. So this time when he came with these CNS symptoms, these were the MRI. And you can see this. What does everyone feel? What is this? TB? Is this TB? Looks like, yeah, it definitely looks like having an ancing lesion with perilational edema. This could be TB, especially when you have MSMD sitting there. So again, CSF is normal. Because he was immunocompromised, a multiplex PCR was done, that was negative, gene expert ultra, MTB no detected, culture no growth, fungal was ruled out, BD glucan, and galactomanin negative, cysti circus ruled out, toxoplasma ruled out. What do you do? Start AKT? No. What would you do? 
Yeah, the thing is to do a biopsy of those lesions, but you know, the risk was 20% that he will be left behind with a side effect of the biopsy. So are you ready to take that 20% risk? We took. This is what grew. Can you tell me what this is? This is also acid fast, but branching filamentous. No cardiosis. So this was no cardiosis. So this child would have landed up with TB treatment as clinically diagnosed TB and would have gone on AKT. We did start AKT while we awaited the biopsy. But after the biopsy came, we stopped the TB treatment and we started no cardia treatment. So this is what happened. So my emphasis is get a microbiological diagnosis. This is a 20-month-old boy from Nepal. He's come with fever, cough, weight loss for two months. So your clinical alg algorithm fits into TB. His mantra test is positive. His gastric lavage gene expert is negative. His aunt has PTB. She's on AKT for one and a half months. Her sputum for AFP was positive. So you have a strong history. You have a mantra positive. He was started on first line as a clinically diagnosed TB. And he was referred to us because there was no improvement. So we are thinking, oh, this could be drug-resistant TB, but we have a gene expert which is negative. So what's the next step that you would do? We'd send a specimen which was gastric lavage. So we can do a bulb. So this was the x-ray. You can see this shadow here. And you can see this consolidation with a cavity inside. <coughs> bulb was negative in this child. Bulb did not pick up any gene expert was negative. So we did a biopsy of that lesion. Fortunately for us, the radiologist couldn't reach the mediastinal mass, went into the lung. So went into that consolidated area, fortunately for us. Okay, and this is the histopath that came out. Can you see the legs and the cuticle? So this was a lung fluke. Yes, paragnosis. So this was a lung fluke. This child just needed praziquantum. So again, I come to that, that you need microbiological diagnosis. Okay. So the whole talk is what pyramid Dr. Shashan showed, that microbiological diagnosis was way on the top, small thing. I think it comes way beyond, down now. In a city like Mumbai, we cannot be sitting and saying clinical diagnosis. In a city like Mumbai, we have to uh, especially when Dr. Puri says that so many CBNAT machines are all across the country, all across the districts. <laughs> we need to have that. So bacteriological diagnosis of TB is essential nowadays. CBNAT is essential. Correct specimen collection is essential. Okay? You just can't send specimens arbitrarily. And there may be a role of XDR panel and gene sequencing in the future. Thank you very much.